and remind us a little bit that today's conversation, we're going to explore um, invasive plants and how they impact biodiversity uh, with a lens, again, our, our lens of insects and birds, because that's a lot of what we uh, are very passionate about, but the ripples go far into our local ecosystems. And we're going to, again, talk about the impact that invasive species play on that biodiversity, and then later talk about habitat fragmentation to better understand how our landscapes, our managed landscapes, can provide habitat. So our first speaker today is uh, Ryan Gulick. And Ryan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop my share and give you a chance to share while I introduce you. Is that OK? All right. So Ryan Gulick has joined us today as a Terrestrial Invasive Species Project Manor, Manager for the Lower Hudson Prism, which is a partnership for invasive species management. And while we in, uh, did share our bios with you or a link to our bios, I did want to mention that in my previous life, I was a landscape design and, and uh, designer and I offered maintenance and installation. And, and some of my most interesting conversations about the impact of invasive species and our plant choices on ecosystems has been with Ryan. And Ryan and I have had some very deep and philosophical discussions about really, you know, the decisions that we make and the impacts that they've had, the ripple effect that they've had on, on ecology. So with that, I'm going to um, invite Ryan to speak. And I, in, I really look forward to a, a conversation and question and answer afterwards. So let's leave some time for that as well. Ryan, thank you. Take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jen. Um, as she said, my name is Ryan Gulick, and I'll be uh, speaking to you guys about ornamental invasive species and really honing in on the ecology, management, and alternatives that you can look for in your home landscaping designs. So first we'll go over invasive ecology and uh, some broad background. So a lot of people are not very familiar with plants. Um, they can see and distinguish animals because we're taught about animals. Um, we talk about animals all the time and um, it, it's really uh, prevalent in culture, um, but we're not very familiar with plants. So a lot of people see a plant and they think, hey, it's green, it's good. Um, but not all plants are created equally. Um, native plants are a plant that has uh, really been a part of the balance of nature and has co-evolved and developed with the other organisms in an ecosystem over hundreds or even thousands of years. Non-native plants, however, are introduced with human help. Um, and this can either be intentionally or accidentally. Um, and they're introduced to a new place or habitat where it's not previously found. Um, it's interesting to note that something that is native to one part of the United States can be non-native in another part of the United States. And lastly, an invasive plant is a non-native plant whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic, environmental, or human health harm. And so it's very important to note that non-native does not mean invasive, um, but an invasive species has to be non-native. A non-native species can have no negative effects, um, but an invasive species has to be non-native. A native plant can be described as aggressive, um, but it can't be described as invasive. And so there is an, uh, a legal definition for an invasive species as well. Um, and this uh, is pretty much what I said before. 
um, but it adds on that the harm of the invasive species must significantly outweigh any benefits that it offers. So uh, you might be asking yourself why native uh, species are so important. Um, well, native plants are really the foundation of the food chain. Uh, most species of native bugs <clears throat> are adapted to eat native plants and can't eat non-native plants. And this even includes generalists. Um, and this is because plants have a lot of chemical defensive compounds uh, within them. Uh, because they really don't want to be eaten. Um, and so through the process of coevolution over hundreds or thousands of years, um, different animals and, and insects have really overcome these plant defensive compounds and are able to eat the plants. And so of course that means that native plants can support the highest volume of insects and insects serve as food for many other animals, including birds. Um, it's really useful to think of bugs as the ecological currency of uh, the environmental world. And so if we want to protect biodiversity, we must protect native species, uh, especially plants. Um, so why do we want to protect biodiversity? Um, so more plants, uh, more invasive plants means less native plants, means less biodiversity. And diverse ecosystems are healthy ecosystems. Um, and this is because species interactions are kept intact. Um, and if you take some species out of a food web, um, it's really complex how many different organisms uh, use uh, and benefit from each other. Um, so if you take one thing out, that really has a big ripple effect on the rest of the food web. And healthy ecosystems perform ecosystem services better. Um, so if it's not enough for you to uh, want to protect nature for nature's own sake, um, if you like clean air, clean water, uh, food security, flood mitigation, uh, climate change mitigation, um, invasive species and protecting biodiversity uh, is important to you because it really does benefit human health and happiness. So invasive species have a few common characteristics about them. And the first one is growth. Um, they have a really high capacity to um, grow very quickly. On the left here, you'll see a uh, forest floor uh, that is completely covered by Japanese stilt grass. Um, and on the right there, um, you've got invasive vines that have completely covered um, both the ground acting as ground cover and is growing up all the trees. Um, and that can really, um, one, uh, block the sunlight from the trees and two, um, the vines can grow to be very heavy and will start to uh, break and damage trees. They also have a really high capacity for reproduction. Um, so on the right here is garlic mustard. And each garlic mustard plant can uh, have an average of 22 seed pods. And they can create as many as 28 seeds per seed pod. So a very vigorous plant can produce as many as 7,900 seeds which is a huge, huge number, um, especially if you think about how many of those seeds can stay in the seed bank for many years and wait for the right opportunity to grow. Uh, another thing about garlic mustard too is that uh, the uh, seed pods are explosive. So when um, the seeds are ripe and ready to be distributed, a small disturbance of that plant brushing past it um, will cause the seed pods to explode and expel the seeds far, further away from the uh, parent plant. 
they're also very adaptable. Uh, here is a picture of Japanese knotweed growing right through concrete. Um, it's really surprising to see that plants are able to do these sort of things. Um, but knotweed is uh, very adaptable and, and can grow under uh, quite a lot of different conditions. Invasive species are also tolerant, more tolerant to stressors like pollution, salt, drought and flooding and other disturbances. And they also lack natural enemies. And this goes back to um, the coevolution of uh, ecosys uh, animals and plants in an ecosystem and, and really taking a lot of time to develop uh, the uh, traits needed to overcome chemical defenses in plants and the ability to eat them. So um, invasive plants uh, harm environmental health in a number of different ways. And perhaps the most obvious is that they take up the space and resources that native species need. And in doing so, they outcompete natives and crowd them out. Um, you can see on the forest floor here on the left, the stilt grass is the only thing growing there. And the same with the kudzu uh, at the old Croton Aqueduct on the right there. There's nothing else growing. They can also directly attack natives. Um, like I said before, vines that grow up trees or grow as ground cover uh, completely block the sunlight from those trees and can uh, weigh down and damage and break branches. Um, but on the right here, you'll see uh, one of my least favorite, uh, but also a very widespread invasive is um, Oriental Bittersweet. And that kind of grows up in a coiling fashion and like a boa constrictor, uh, squeezes that tree and uh, prevents it from sending water and nutrients uh, up and down throughout the tree. Invasive species can also modify the environment. Um, so they can take out or put in extra nutrients. They change water availability. Um, some invasive species even have chemical growth inhibitors um, that they put into the soil. This is called allelopathy. Um, they can change the microbial activity in the soil and change the nutrient cycling as well. And some of these effects can even be persistent. Um, so this patch here is uh, where an invasive species was removed, um, but even after it was removed, you can see that nothing else is able to grow there. Invasive species can also be a big harm to human health. <clears throat> So this plant in particular, uh, giant hogweed, is very, very dangerous and an invasive species. Um, if you brush past it and the sap gets on your skin and it's exposed to sunlight, um, you can get some very serious chemical burns. Um, and if the sap gets on your eye as well, it can even blind you. Japanese barberry is a great example of a species that not only has environmental impacts, but uh, human health impacts as well. And the human health impacts are a little bit less direct. Um, so Japanese barberry changes the soil chemistry. Um, the leaves drop down and break down and make it more difficult for anything other than barberry to grow there. Um, and it also creates a microclimate underneath the bushes. So the protective habitat is great habitat for white-footed mice. And it also creates a micro-humid uh, climate that is great for ticks. And tick nymphs also love to feed on white-footed mice. So 
there's an increase in white-footed mice, an increase in tick numbers, and so an increase in the prevalence of Lyme disease as well. There's also a lot of economic harm impacts. Um, so a lot of pathogens and insects can uh, really impact um, our industries uh, such as uh, timber and crop um, and, and other industries as well. Um, so on the left here, we have chestnut blight. We all know how that went. Um, chestnut completely wiped out almost every uh, chestnut tree that we have. Um, the emerald ash borer is um, somewhat newer um, than the chestnut blight um, and is having a lot of similar effects on our ash trees as chestnut blight had on chestnut tree. Um, and spotted lanternfly is one of the newer uh, invaders that is really causing a lot of economic harm. Um, it got here about five years ago. Um, and has, uh, it was first seen in Pennsylvania and just recently got to New York as well. And this invasive plant hopper um, can ho feed on over 80 different host species, including things like grapes, tomatoes, hops, um, and a lot of timber crops as well. They can also invade home landscapes and really be a nuisance there. Uh, you can see here that Lester Salandine has completely taken over um, this uh, landowner's uh, backyard. And so when you step back and look at it, um, the cost of invasive species is very, very high. Um, the United States spends more than $120 billion on invasive species management every year. And this comes in the form of control costs, um, the value and quality of land being degraded, um, lowered crop, crop productivity, um, the ecotourism industry can be damaged as well. Um, and invasive species can also act as uh, vectors for disease. So invasive species can also spread by a number of different ways. Um, it can be spread by both nature and humans, but they're usually spread by humans. And in nature, they can be spread by wind, um, rain, waterways, and even gravity. Um, and they can also be carried by animals. Um, so some uh, invasives have seeds that stick to animals like rabbits or, or deers they walk by. Um, but this is especially true for birds who will eat the berries of uh, non-native invasive plants, um, perhaps in a garden. Um, and then fly into the forest and spread those seeds there. And um, by humans, these, uh, the spread can be either intentional um, through ornamental planting or um, for ecological reasons in the past as well. Um, kudzu, for example, was planted widely like dozens of millions of seedlings were uh, given away to plant um, to curb soil erosion in the 1940s and 50s uh, before they realized what a huge impact um, kudzu would have on uh, natural areas nearby. Uh, this can also be unintentional spread um, so packing material uh, like stilk grass was a packing material and that's how that got here. Um, fishing bait, if people throw out their leftover fishing bait um, and dumping it on the ground or throwing it in the water. Um, moving firewood as well. Um, and then we have uh, hitchhikers um, such as uh, zebra mussels in ballast water. Um, muddy boots can carry a variety of different seeds and equipment, um, if it's not cleaned, um, uh, can also spread invasives. 
the pet trade industry is also a big um, uh, pathway for invasive species spread. And so it, it really takes quite a long time uh, for an invasive species to, um, to really take over an environment in an ecosystem. There is a logarithmic uh, exponential invasion curve where um, a plant is introduced um, and it takes a while before it gets detected. Um, and in that time between introduction, detection, and land managers becoming aware of the problem, um, the plants are uh, reproducing and increasing the number of different populations that they have, um, and it gets out of hand quite quickly. Um, it can take even decades from the initial introduction before an invasive species uh, is really, really a problem that we can see. Um, and this is something to really uh, take note of and take away from, uh, because I'll talk to a lot of people that um, say, oh, well, this plant isn't a problem in my garden, and um, I've never seen it spread. Um, well, it takes a long time and the effects aren't always obvious at the beginning. So there are quite a few factors that affect invasion as well. Um, habitat suitability is a big one. Um, environmental disturbance is another big one. So if you go in and disturb the soil, or if there's a windstorm and a tree falls and there's a lot of light, uh, those are ideal um, areas for invasives to uh, invade. Propagule pressure, um, so how many different populations there are that are reproducing, um, rate of reproduction, uh, the ease of distribution and spread of these species, and other species characteristics as well. So these are the top invaders in our forests, and these are all tier four widespread species. And if you're not familiar with the tiering system, New York um, breaks down their invasive species into tiers, and you can view that at the lowerhudsonprism.org. Um, and so Japanese barberry, Japanese stiltgrass, multiflora rose, wineberry, oriental bittersweet, garlic mustard, burning bush, Norway maple, Japanese honeysuckle, and tree of heaven. Many of these widespread invasives were originally planted as ornamentals in gardens. And to help stop that pathway, of landscaping ornamentals uh, affecting um, uh, natural areas, uh, New York passed a law, Part 575, that prohibits or regulates the possession, transport, importation, sale, purchase, and introduction of select invasive species. Um, so, for prohibited species, um, you can't sell them, import them, purchase them, transport them, or introduce them, um, or, or propagate them either. Regulated species, it's a bit trickier. Um, and a lot of the language is the same. So uh, species cannot be knowingly introduced into a free living state or introduced by means that one should have known would lead to an introduction, although such species shall be legal to possess, sell, buy, propagate, and transport. And really what this means, if a plant is regulated, you have to put a label on it that says that it is harmful to the environment. Um, I'm not really a big fan of the difference between regulation and pro prohibition. Um, I think that just putting a label on a plant that we know is harmful is not enough. If we know it's harmful, 
uh, I think that we should really just stop using it altogether. Um, you can get a permit to possess or transport prohibited species. Um, and this is really the case for um, land managers that uh, need to move these plants around in, in removal efforts. Um, and then transport for the purpose of identification and disposal is allowed of these regulated and prohibited species. So some common plants that are on this list include oriental bittersweet, garlic mustard, multiflora rose, Japanese knotweed, Japanese honeysuckle, Japanese stillgrass, purple loosestrife, and Japanese barberry. Um, more include sycamore maple, privet, bush honeysuckles, garden loosestrife, and running bamboos. And some of the less common invasive species that are prohibited include Japanese angelica tree, porcelain berry, black swallowwort, mile a minute vine, Chinese bush clover or lespedeza, and a more cork tree. Um, so part 575 is actually in the process of being updated for the first time since it was passed in 2015. Um, people, land managers, the general public can submit species um, to be uh, considered to be added to this list. Um, and so that process is going to take a couple of years to be completed. Um, but you can expect to see uh, new prohibited and regulated species in the next couple of years. So next, I'm going to talk about management. <clears throat> um, so who is doing invasive species work? Um, new York is broken up into eight different partnerships for regional invasive species management. Um, and this acronym is PRISM. The PRISMs focus on building partnerships, uh, outreach and education, and eradication of new invaders. Um, and other entities that are doing invasive species management include governmental agencies like the DEC, the DEP, um, Ag and Markets, Bureau of Land Management, um, nonprofit land stewards, um, for profit environmental consultant businesses, and volunteers as well. So, I mentioned earlier the tier system that uh, the Lower Hudson Prism puts different invasive species into. Um, Tier one are high impact species that are not here yet. And uh, our goal for those are to survey in likely introduction areas. Tier two species are invasives that are new to the area and at low abundance. And our goal is to eradicate the known populations. Tier three are more established in the region. And we like to contain these species to prevent spread especially at boundary populations, things that are the most northern population, the most western population, etc. And tier four species are widespread throughout the region and beyond. And we really um, focus on local suppression there. Um, can't do too much about widespread species other than locally suppress them. Um, and tier five species are watch species, um, things that uh, we know are here um, and could be invasive, um, but we haven't seen them jump around too much yet. Um, so we're just watching them. Um, and this list is updated every single year. We have a working group that gets together and talks about um, all the different plants, animals, um, and other invasives on the list and uh, talks about um, both their anecdotal in the field observations um, and data um, to re-rank and re-tier uh, the invasives every year. 
Um, so aside from really targeting emerging invasives as a regional strategy uh, to prevent them from becoming more widespread, um, we also focus on preserving native habitats and species and rare and threatened habitats and species as well. We like to keep the nice areas nice. So we defend natives uh, against threats. Uh, this includes invasive species, um, forest pests and diseases, um, excessive disturbance, pollution, other stressors, um, including deer, um, which really have a, a huge negative impact on native species because uh, deer avoid eating invasive species and love to eat native seedlings. Um, so there's a lot of issues with regeneration in our forests because of the overpopulation of deer. And when we remove invasives, we like to push towards a native habitat with restoration. Um, and this could either be active or passive restoration. Passive restoration meaning um, removing the invasives and um, looking at the uh, species nearby. And if, if there's a lot of natives nearby, um, watching to see what happens because there might be a native seed bank um, that will push through and outcompete the natives uh, after management or active management, meaning going through and actively planting plugs or scattering seed. Um, so here I have some general management ideas and tips. Um, so invasive species management is a multi-year process. And this is because of the seed bank that I mentioned before. Um, a lot of invasive seeds can last in the soil for, for years, um, some six years, some even decades. Um, and it also is uh, because if you don't remove all of the plant, um, it will probably send out new growth um, later that year or in following years. The proper use of herbicides can speed up the process drastically in invasive species management. You're going to want to work to contain the infestation if you can't completely remove it. Um, so areas like uh, uphill, um, so that uh, gravity doesn't continue to push seeds downhill, um, outer edges of the populations, mature or fruiting plants, um, and other uh, considerations. It's really site dependent. Um, it's really key to manage every part of the plant and remove as much as you can, especially the root. Um, and like I said before, this is because um, uh, invasive species can spread through uh, both vegetation fragments or root fragments, depending on the species. Each plant has specific best management practices. Um, so the improper management, so if you don't follow these best management practices, can lead to ineffective control, so you waste time and money, or the spread of the invasive as well. Um, so some examples of this, if you pull a plant with a deep tap root, it's likely going to break off and you're not going to get the root and it's going to come right back. Um, or if you cut an aggressive re-sprouter, um, the plant is going to have a robust root system um, and a lot of re-sprouts coming up, um, and that won't manage the plant either. Um, you're really going to want to try to manage the plants before they go to seed. Um, that's just a lot easier. Um, because if you're moving around and messing the plant uh, with the plant while they're in seed, a lot of the seeds are probably going to drop. Um, or uh, when you're disposing of the plant, um, you might be spreading it as well. Um, you're really going to want to clean your boots, clothing, and equipment on site to avoid the spread of these invasive species. 
and proper disposal will depend on the site, but should leave the plant completely incapacitated, unable to grow or reproduce. So this can be done by double bagging and throwing it out in the regular garbage, um, bagging and solarizing, so leaving it out to cook in the sun, uh, chipping, incinerating, or if you're deep in the woods and it's not feasible to do any of these things, um, piling them on an impervious surface like a big rock. Uh, if you don't have a big rock available, um, you can pile the invasives in um, within the infestation area um, to really concentrate where that material is so that you can go back and check on the infestation and that pile later. So manual management is most effective on young plants with shallow roots. Um, so some common methods include pull-up, and some tips that I have for this is you're really going to want to grab the place as a plant as low as you can and pull up in the direction that the plant is growing, so it's not necessarily straight up. And you're going to want to pull gently at first with increasing pressure, because if you pull with all your might right at the beginning, um, you're probably going to break off that plant and leave the roots behind. You can also wiggle the plant back and forth a little bit to try and loosen the roots in the soil as you're pulling. Dig up, using a tool to dig up or leverage out plants. Um, and typically you can dig up and loosen the soil a little bit and then pull up the plant. Um, girdling is a method where you remove a strip several centimeters wide around the trunk to prevent the transfer of nutrients and water. Um, cut only is a method I would not recommend. Um, it was, it's where you cut the plant at the base, um, but many plants will re-sprout. Um, and mowing is effectively doing the same thing. <clears throat> um, solarizing is where you cut plants at base level, um, so cut only, and then you apply a cover, it's either cardboard or thick plastic, over the soil to block sunlight and increase temperatures. And if you're going to try solarizing, um, you're really going to want to weigh down the edges of uh, the cover that you put down um, so that it doesn't get blown away and the plants don't grow out the side. Um, and it's something that you have to check up on frequently to make sure that nothing has broken through that cover. Um, so some tools that uh, we use for manual management, um, tarp for moving around plants, uh, garbage bags for disposal, um, power tools, we don't use any, um, but especially for larger infestations or larger trees, um, these are very helpful. Um, cutting tools, including loppers, pruners, and hand saws. Um, digging tools, my favorite is the pickmatic, uh, but shovels and soil knives uh, also work here. Um, and there's also something called a weed wrench that helps you leverage out plants. Um, it's a tool specifically designed for uh, habitat management. Um, it's very bulky and heavy though, um, so uh, we, we don't use them very often, but uh, for medium-sized shrubs and trees, it's really a great tool if you're only working with a few individuals. Um, and some personal protective equipment. Uh, definitely want some sturdy gloves and boots on and eye protection as well, because uh, dirt's gonna be flying, plant material's gonna be whipping around. Um, so next uh, for chemical management, and of course um, you're going to want to look into uh, the chemical that you want to use and you need to follow all label instructions. Uh, the pest, method, and site must all be on the label. There are some chemicals that are restricted use that you would need to get a um, pesticide license for. 
Um, and there are also, if you can't find a chemical that you want to use um, or that you can use, um, there are two EEs that are addendums to pesticide labels. And you can apply for two EEs or check to see if there are any um, for additional species listed. Some common methods here include cut stump which takes cut only a step further, where you cut the plant and then you apply herbicide along the outer edge on that living tissue of the plant. Um, and that uh, goes down into the roots and kills the root. Um, basal bark, you apply herbicide around the lower six inches of a woody plant. Um, and this is typically done with an oil-based herbicide and um, the oil sticks to the uh, bark and the herbicide uh, goes through the bark. Um, and this is best on trees and shrubs that are um, less than six inches uh, diameter at breast height. Foliar spray is when you spray diluted herbicide on leaves. Um, frill is when you make shallow angled cuts around a woody plant and apply herbicide in the cuts. Uh, but it's very important that with frilling, you do not girdle the plant. You don't want those cuts to go all the way around because you want the systemic herbicide to be able to travel up and down throughout the plant. And if you girdle it, it won't be able to do that. And then for hollow plants, there is stem injection, um, where you inject herbicide uh, right into the plant. Uh, so again, for chemical management, we have some tools here. Um, tarps are great for moving around plant material, garbage bags if you're doing cut only, um, flagging material, um, so pin flags and flagging tape especially if you've got a larger area and you want to get all the cutting done at once, you can flag stumps so that you know to go back and treat them. Um, cutting equipment, including loppers, pruners, hand saws, and any power equipment that you might have. Um, application equipment, spray bottles are great for um, basal bark. Um, foaming bottles um, are great little tools um, where uh, if they're like a pump action bottle and just a little bit of foam comes out um, and that helps with cut stumps so that one, you're using less herbicide uh, and two, it goes uh, onto exactly where you're trying to put it. Um, it doesn't squirt out and accidentally contaminate the environment. Canister sprayers for foliar and backpack sprayers for foliar as well. There are also some canister sprayers that can use, be used for uh, basal bark. Um, and for personal protective equipment, um, the label is the law. You must follow all PPE on the label. Um, and this is usually a minimum of long pants and long shirt, chemical resistant boots and gloves, and eye protection. Um, some will require respirators as well and other uh, PPE. So lastly, I'll talk about native alternatives to invasive ornamentals. We have uh, quite a long list of uh, invasives that we don't want planted and uh, ornamental native plants uh, or non-natives that don't spread. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave this up for a second so you can take a look, um, but I won't be going through every single one. I've taken a select few um, that I found the most interesting. Um, that we can take a deeper look at. Um, so the ones that we don't want planted include bittersweet, uh, Japanese virgin's bower, black swallowwort, pale swallowwort, Japanese hops, Japanese honeysuckle, and kudzu. Um, and these are all vines. 
So one of my favorite native vines is Dutchman's Pipe. Um, and this is a twining vine. Um, it doesn't usually flower, but um, when it does flower, it has a really awesome maroon colored flower. Um, and it is good in both full sun and part shade. We also have, um, it's Zoom's blocking, uh, wonder if I, I can move that control, great. Uh, we also have trumpet vine here, um, and this is a clinging vine rather than a, a twining vine, um, and it has beautiful coral-shaped flowers. Um, it is uh, deciduous, so the leaves fall off in the, in the fall, in the winter, um, and it's really tolerant to a lot of different soil conditions. Um, it doesn't grow very well in shade, um, but it grows very well in full sun. Uh, it attracts uh, hummingbirds, pollinators, and is quite deer resistant as well. And next we have Clematis, um, Clematis jackmani here. Uh, this is another twining vine um, that does well in both full sun and part shade. Um, it attracts a lot of pollinators and uh, resists deer brows. Um, and both the foliage is interesting and the flowers. The foliage is a, a nice blue green color um, and the, uh, the flowers are a really brilliant bright purple. Uh, if you're looking into Clematis, um, it does prefer cool roots, so you're going to want to shade the roots with annual plantings or mulch. Um, so some targeted invasive trees that we have are Japanese angelica tree, Norway maple, smooth buckthorn, black locust, and common buckthorn. I'll leave this up for a minute so that you can look at all of the alternatives there as well. Um, so an alternative is striped maple. Um, this is a native plant that can be known as aggressive, um, but it's really a, an interesting uh, little tree that we have here. It is a smaller tree and it does well in full shade or part sun. Um, it's an understory plant and the bark itself is quite ornamental, having lar uh, long stripes on it. And it has um, really awesome leaves in the fall. Uh, they turn gold in color. Um, it's a host plant for over 200 different species, and it transplants very easily. Basswood as well is another uh, native tree. Um, it is a host plant to over 100 different species. This one grows uh, well in uh, full sun. Um, and is uh, really easy with bare root transplanting. It is susceptible to a few different uh, diseases and pests, um, but it's a really great, great tree. Next we have fringe tree, which is another um, smaller tree um, that has really showy flowers um, that are white, and really showy blue berries as well. Um, it's pest free, can grow in full sun or part shade um, and attracts uh, pollinators as well. There are quite a few invasive shrubs and alternatives. I'll just leave this up for a little bit so that you can take a look at them. Um, we'll also be sending out uh, resources on invasive plants to not plant and alternatives to plant in their place. Um, so one shrub that I selected from that list is oak leaf hydrangea. Um, 
it's got a really interesting flower structure um, and it's cool to see um, some oak-like leaves on a, on a shrub like this. Um, in the fall, the foliage turns a really nice purple-red color. Um, it's pretty pest and disease-free, can grow in full sun, part shade, or full shade. Uh, it's really, really a nice plant um, that it does form colonies, um, just to be aware of that. Next, we have inkberry, which is a native holly. Um, this will also grow well in full sun, part shade or full shade. It's a broadleaf evergreen and uh, really a, a nice alternative to um, some of the um, boxwood or um, other uh, smaller shrubs that, that have similar leaf patterns. Um, it's well suited to plant as a hedge or in mass and it responds well to shearing. Um, it has some cool black fruit. Um, that's where it gets the name inkberry. Um, and it requires a male for pollination in case um, you do want to have berries. You'll need both a male and female plant. Um, it's pretty trouble free as well. And we've also got bayberry, which is one of my favorites because of uh, the really fragrant leaves that it has. Um, and it attracts quite a lot of um, birds and pollinators. It's disease free, um, it's slow growing, and does well in full sun or part shade. Uh, again, quite a long list of invasive perennials. We've even got two slides for this one. Um, so I'll leave this up for a second. The resource will also be coming out to you with a, a lot of these plants on the list. That was the same slide, sorry about that. <clears throat> Um, so the first one I picked out of that list was Swamp ver Verbena. Um, it likes moist soil, but can grow in full sun, uh, full shade, or, or a mix between the two. Um, it has some really showy flowers and, and flower spikes, um, and attracts um, birds and, and native uh, butterflies as well. We've got the leopard plant here as well. Um, I really liked the leaf shape there. Uh, grows these um, really large, wide, leathery foliage. Um, it has a tall stalk that the yellow flowers grow on. Um, it does well in moist soil, um, and it does well in full shade or part sun, and is deer resistant. Um, and next we have stone crop, which is a very interesting little plant. Um, it is a succulent perennial um, that has really quite wonderful flowers. Um, and the color and form may vary, so there are different cultivars out there. Um, it does well in dry soil and full sun or part sun. And lastly, we have some targeted invasive grasses here. I'll leave that up for a second. Um, a nice native grass is feather reed grass. Um, it's very, very tough and can grow in a, a lot of different soil conditions. We've got pink uh, mooly grass, which has a, a quite a delightful um, pink color and tint to it. Um, it has that very attractive summer foliage and it does not spread by rhizomes and grows in drier soils um, with full sun or part shade. And lastly, we have prairie drop seed here um, for uh, more of a, a standard looking grass. Um, it's pink, pink and brown tinted, um, does well in full sun, not very shade tolerant and dry conditions. Um, and with that, I will wrap up and take any questions that anybody has.
I have not been monitoring the chat. So um, if anybody was and, and can pull a couple of questions from there, that would be great. Um, and I know that Jen also has a poll. Um, hey, Ryan. So um, there are a few questions. Let me just uh, scroll up here. Um, I know Jen was answering some of them. Um, let's just start at the top here. Um, can you please discuss bindweed and why it is not on the list of worst offenders? Bindweed. Um, yeah, bindweed is, from what I've seen, um, not as widespread as a lot of the other species. And um, here, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm not super familiar with bindweed. In fact, um, uh, I, I've never managed it myself. Um, so um, in terms of really um, going, digging down into the ecology, uh, I can't answer that question too well. Um, but field bindweed, um, it's actually excluded from the Lower Hudson Prism um, list of tiered ranks. Um, and I could, I could ask about why that was excluded. Um, and get back to you uh, if you send me an email about that. Great, thank you, Ryan. Um, okay, going down the list, um, and we'll have some um, resources for everybody as well as far as suppliers, but um, do you have any suggestions for suppliers for native species to plant in the forests or wetlands? Yeah. Um, so the DEC, I believe, does have a native plant nursery up near Albany and Saratoga. Um, and other than that, um, it's really going to be looking at local native plant nurseries um, to find those resources. Um, I don't have a list compiled, um, but um, I, we might have that resource somewhere within our network. Thank you. Um, a comment um, from Maya, I wish there were invasive plant disposal areas all over the place, a place to bring these plants where they can be properly destroyed. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me, that would be great. Um, that would be ideal. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case. And, and so um, there are quite a few different ways um, to really ensure that the invasive plant is incapacitated. Um, and what we usually use the most, since we work a lot off trail, deep in the forest, is uh, piling up those invasive species um, on a rock or hanging them up in a tree so that the root does not touch the soil. Um, and we typically uh, really go for ongoing projects and send our crews back to continually manage and monitor species that we're managing. Um, so we go back and, and um, really check up on those infestations. Um, but yeah, that would be great. I'm with you it there. Would be. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, Christine asks, what is the best, me best method for removing vines growing up trees, if not cutting them at the base? Yeah, so um, for vine management, um, that is really going to be the one case where if you're not using um, herbicides, cut only is going to be your only uh, method of removal, unless you can get at the roots. I mean, it's it's going to be very difficult because they're going to be tangled up with all the tree roots that are right there too. Um, so with vine management, uh, you're going to want to cut it as low to the ground as you can and as high up as you can. Um, and that will kill the above ground portion. The roots will still be alive. Um, but when you do make those cuts, it's important not to unwind and pull down that vine. 
Um, you might think that uh, that would be something good to do, but um, you can damage the tree if you're doing that, um, and you can cause branches to fall and get hurt as well. Great, thank you. Um, there's a comment from Victoria. She mentions it's important to mention that though trumpet vine is beautiful and very beneficial, um, it spreads prolifically prolifically and really should not be planted near houses as the root system can cause spread beneath the foundation and become problematic. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, yeah, I'm much less versed on native uh, planting in landscapes than I am with invasive species. So um, thank you for, for pointing that out. Great. Um, Joanna is asking, oak leaf hydrangea showed only southern states. Is it zone five as well? Um, let's take a look and see. And I added a comment to that because I know and um, I know that we have it growing successfully up to the mid New York state. It's quite quite hardy. Oh, great. Thanks, Jen. Thank I didn't know. see that. Yeah, no, that's okay. It was, it, there's a lot going on in that chat. <laughs> but certainly in the lower Hudson Valley, an excellent native plant choice. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, Ryan, did you wanna say anything else to that or would you like me to move on? Um, no, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it grows in, in zone five or not. Okay. Um, Victoria is asking, as the ink berry needs both a male and female to bury, I have found it difficult to find males only in the straight species. And I understand that the cultivar Nordic also produces male flowers. Are there any other male cultivars? That is a great question. Um, I'm not sure the answer to that though. I'm sorry. Okay. I would have to, I would suggest consulting the great oracle of Michael Durr. The Durr manual has so many different cultivars listed and they usually give that kind of information. But then again, you have to turn around and see if you can find that cultivar in the trade, right? That's that, as you were mentioning some of these, Ryan, I was thinking, wow, I would love to use that plant like striped maple. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember if a place like Earth Tones carries striped maple because it is a beautiful tree. It's really lovely. Anyhow, sorry to interrupt, but it's a conversation, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, and then um, I see one more and I am going to just, Jen, you might wanna take this one because I know I'm not gonna pronounce this one right from Joanna here, Lemiastrum. Yeah, the Lemia, the, um, not, uh, the yellow archangel. Is yellow archangel, I think it is gay, L-A, gay, L-A, oh my God, is that spelled right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was gonna like clobber that name there. Galeo, <laughs> I got as far as Galeo Dalon. <laughs> and I've had, I've had training in, in botanical Latin, holy cow. Um, um, so I have seen yellow archangel um, be invasive before. It is on our watch list, our tier five, uh, because we know it's here, we know it's in gardens, um, and we have seen it jump a few times. Um, I've actually worked on some yellow archangel infestations before in nature preserves. Um, so we're actually in the process of updating our tier list now. Um, and that might be uh, bumped up from a tier five watch list to tier two emerging invasive. Great, thank you. Um, and one last thing, Kiera, she says, I do wanna add a thank you for touching on the connection between invasive and, oh, as it, uh, between invasives and ecosystem to human health, since that's often what will turn people to what want to get rid of their ornamentals like Japanese barberry. She's an infectious disease epidemiologist as well and wish we had better training with importance of understanding ecosystems and their impact to infectious diseases and human health. Yeah, I, I completely agree that um, that point is often overlooked. Um, 
And it, it's really important to take a step back and realize that one, um, we're not separate from or dominant over nature. We are a part of nature. And that two, if nature is doing well, if nature is healthy and happy, then we're benefiting so much from that as well. Um, and I think these are points that are often overlooked um, in the invasive species discussion. Great. Um, two more just came in, if, if you don't mind answering these, and then we can take a, a quick leg stretch. Um, Ryan, what do you suggest for eradicating creeping Charlie? It can take over native ground covers. Yeah, so I'm going to open up the Lower Hudson Pre Prism Species Information page here. Um, and here I'll actually share my screen again. And this resource is being um, sent out um, as well. I'm glad to not see that come up. <laughs> because it is actually an awesome uh, pollinator resource plan. Mm. So. Yeah, for really any of the um, species that you have questions for best management practices, um, using that phrase best management practices in a google search huh it's not on here um is is really going to be your your best bet um but this uh search database here is also um a great resource um where we are constantly updating it and adding more species and you can get a lot of background information manual management strategies and chemical management strategies. Um, so uh, if you're looking to use um, just manual methods, of course, I would um, try and get as much of the root as possible. And you're probably going to need to use some tools for that, either hand travels or whatnot. Um, and for something like that, it's a, a native ground cover. Um, you really can't do cut stump on that. You can't do basal bark on that. So your only option there, if you're not doing uh, manual and you want to use chemical, uh, would be a foliar spray. Great. Um, not to push us ahead, but um, are natives adapting to climate change? Anne is asking. Are natives adapting to climate change? Well, adapting to climate change. Now, see, there are going to be some winners and some losers with climate change. And this goes for both native and invasive species. It's thought that more invasive species are going to be winners compared to losers because they are more tolerant and they're more robust. Um, to these conditions than native plants. Um, so are they adapting? They probably are. Um, they're probably trying to, at least some of them. Um, and do you consider moving their range adapting because uh, things are moving towards the poles because of, um, you know, wanting to be in the same climate that they were in previously? Um, so if you consider uh, moving their range, adapting, I'd say yes, a lot of species are doing that. Um, but what's important to note here is that um, plants can only move so quickly and that uh, there's a lot of change happening very, very quickly. And that evolution also takes a really, really long time. Now there is something called uh, phenotypic plasticity um, where um, under different conditions, different organisms can express different traits. Um, and so uh, that can be seen as adaption as well. Um, but everything, everything is either adapting to climate change and will thrive or trying to adapt to climate change or is unable to adapt and is just going to be pushed out uh, completely. Um, so the answer in short 
it, it's very complicated and I don't have a lot of background research on how natives are adapting to climate change. Uh, but I would say yes and no, depending on the species. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and there's, oh, they just keep coming in. So <laughs> people are very interested in this. Um, how are you dealing with purple loose strife in wetlands? Purple loose strife um, has actually taken a very big hit. Um, purple loose strife is a poster child for biocontrol. Um, and geez, I, it must have been a, a decade ago or so that um, purple loose strife, uh, the biocontrol two decades ago, um, where uh, the biocontrol insect was released and uh, really, really did well in reducing um, loose strife populations. Um, I typically don't do work on um, widespread species or even um, established species. I typically only work on emerging tier two invasives and purple loose strife is not that. Um, so I haven't been personally dealing with purple loose strife, um, but I'd assume that there is um, on top of the biocontrol option, um, there are some herbicides that are uh, safe to use near water, um, but they're all prohibited, so, um, or regulated rather, meaning that you have to have a pesticide license to use them. Um, so uh, I'm not sure as to the manual removal of loose strife. I imagine that would be a pain. Um, but uh, it, it really has taken a hit from the biocontrol. All right, well, thank you everybody for all of your wonderful questions and your attention. Thank you so much, Ryan.